Oh, 
So we'll start with our coming events this evening. Ladies quilting every Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the upstairs quilting room. Sing Inspiration this Sunday. We're all looking forward to that. If you haven't signed up, please feel free to do so. Sunday School for Kids upstairs every Sunday morning at 945. Are there any other Announcements are coming events. December's birthdays. We have Steve Bigelow on the 20th and Junie Asher on the 26th. Do we have any praise that we would like to raise up this evening? Andrew. I get to pick up my son and have him for Christmas. I haven't had him on Christmas for four years. So I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. That's awesome. Andrew gets to spend Christmas with his son for the first time in four years. So I'm going first for my son's mother and my son that will be traveling and the weather's full of Christmas. Okay. Prayers for Andrew's son's mother as she travels. I'll take first. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, Randy. Yes, sir. Um, our daughter, uh, same type of situation. This is the first time in eight years she's got to spend Christmas with her daughter. She got to come down and pick her up. She's going to take her home, get to speak, spend some time with her. That's awesome. Yeah. So Prudence gets to spend time with her daughter as well this Christmas. She came down, she visited today, actually. Okay. Prudence got to visit Rosie today, and then she's going to take her back to Seattle for a Christmas break. Too. That's awesome. That's great. Praise and prayers. Sister Susie. Oh, thank you for the quilting on the thing, Mark, and cleaning up. Okay. So that came out well. Carpet cleaning in the quilting room. Awesome. <clears throat> so we would like to praise our Heavenly Father for Roger, who is going home feeling much better. Also for Kenny, Noreen's friend, <coughs> and the Colbate Village, who is being able to expand 
to help more people. Is there anyone that we would like to add to our prayer list this morning? This evening? Janet? Lois uh, McPherson isn't uh, feeling well. She thinks she's got the flu. So we will add Lois McPherson to our prayer list. Hopefully it's just the flu. That's what she thinks. Okay. Is there any others? So we have Marty on our prayer list. We also have Wanda with a stomach ulcer. We need to keep Sarah in our prayers. She faces her challenges. As well as Danny Knowlton, who has passed away. We'll keep his family in our prayers. Rex Eric, his friend, with congestive heart failure. As well as Kit Fredrickson, involved in a car accident with some broken bones. <coughs> Lawrence's foot and Jerry's injection in the eyes. Lauren Matthews' daughter, still waiting on test results. We'll continue to pray for Megan's illness and keep Stacy in our prayers. Along with Jane, Maureen's friend, and Andrew. Over at Colbank with a shattered collarbone. Cassidy, our neighbor, prayers for her and for her family. As well as John, Lawrence's uncle, will remain in our prayers. Mac, Susie's brother in law, continue to pray for Mac. As well as Paul, Muriel's nephew. Who's dealing with physical therapy? <clears throat> Thomas Carey's friend is back in the hospital, as well as Candy with a broken femur. Sue Antolin, George's sister, struggling with cancer. And Rosalind will remain in our prayers. Yes. As well as Bob Sultan. Aneurysm and gallstone. And Lois, who isn't able to be with us this evening, we'll continue to pray for her ankle pain. Wyatt will remain in our prayers, as well as Weston with his concussion. Also, Jack and Dick. We'll continue to pray for Brother Dick. Any problems on his hip and his hip, as well as Joe and his wife. Lola's mother still needs our prayers, along with David Sultan and all the victims of the tornado and the severe weather in the Midwest and the South. Anyone else that we'd like to add to our prayer list? I think we should add all the travelers for the holidays. All the travelers for the holidays. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, for the moment, yes. Is my nephew Brent on there? I forgot about it too. So. I don't think so. Oh, is he? Thank you. That's the last Sunday I asked for. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, Gordon will start us off and I'll finish this up. Father, we have a good for Father, for through Jesus. Pray for you to have hope. Pray, Lord,
always continues to enable me. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for so many things. You help us all the time, dear Lord, and we thank you. Thank you for helping us through the struggles in life. Thank you for helping us in our fight against the devil. Every day he's trying to lead us the wrong way. And we know you're there to help guide us. And we thank you for that, dear Lord. I pray that you'll be with all those on the prayer list that need your help. I pray that you'll help comfort those that need it most and guide those that are lost. Help heal those that need your healing touch. Comfort those that use their pain to terminal and be heading to you soon. Pray that you'll be with all those families that have lost loved ones, dear Lord. Help comfort and guide them. It's a hard time right now, dear Lord. People need you more than ever. We all need you. Thank you for being here and we pray that you'll always be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for this time together. It's so precious. And I pray for your sake that we may just thank you for all you mean to us as we bring the strength we need to bear with each other and lift them up for each other. It's so precious. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
greatest would be that everybody was there traveling to a room, that they would get to their destination safely and get home and away from there and get their time. God would protect us all. Be with us always, we pray in Jesus' name. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be with all of those on our prayer list this week. Please be with the ones that are sick and the ones that are injured. And please bring them back to health. And please be with the families who have lost loved ones and friends and neighbors. Heavenly Father, please be with the individuals who have been affected by the severe weather in the Midwest and the South. And we pray that be with those families and with our brothers and sisters down there. Give them strength and courage to get through these difficult times. We pray that you'll be with uh, all the travelers this holiday for everyone who's traveling and please keep them safe and watch over the fellowship with their families. Please be with our members who couldn't be with us this evening. Norma and Barbara and Everyone, we list them all, Heavenly Father. Please keep them safe and bring them back to us soon. Please be with Wilma. Give her strength and to deal with the situation with the COVID virus in her home and keep her and her friends safe. And please be with Gordon and give him strength and help him to. This evening. Thank you for Brother Derek. Thank you for all of our many blessings. Please continue to watch over us and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Sir, I'm just one. Uh, Steve Bidwell had a text in the prayer text today that it was a relative that's not Camille. Camille. Is not doing well and has a lot of depression. Okay, so we'll add Camille to our prayer list. Same. Dealing with depression. Yes, sir. Is there anything else? Brother Derek. Hey, does anybody know Pam and Franklin are home? She went to the doctor. Are they off the road? They stay home today. All right. So they're home, off the road. Good morning, Derek. Love you, Derek. 
We are in First John this evening. Could you please say that again? First John. Okay. Chapter two. Let's see that. One John. In prayer, Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for John. We thank you for all his words. How they inspire us and encourage us. We thank you that uh, you have given us so many letters in your word to receive instruction from and encouragement. And we just pray that seemingly we might just be enriched by his words once again. We pray that in Jesus' name. First John chapter 2, and starting in verse 12. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I am writing to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. I'm going to stop there. In this section, John... It, um, he's looking at what it is to be a Christian follower, and I think in these terms that he's not talking directly to children and teenagers, but he's actually talking about spiritual growth, because he's been talking about the Christian life and using a lot of metaphors and um, our walk in, in uh, the Christian life, and I think these are different stages uh, in our spiritual walk spiritual development so children you know, the stage of childhood uh, which not only um, John talks about but also Paul talks and Peter talks in these terms of you know and sometimes even in a negative way when they're when they're saying you know your children still craving spiritual milk but you need to grow up you know and uh, eat the solid food uh, and uh, so that that's what I think he's saying there. And also in terms of, um, you know, gender, um, the Greek as well as the English, you know, they, they use the term men, and also, you know, men were the ones that studied under the teaching, and a lot of times the women were excluded from this. But, you know, Jesus liberated the women, and uh, also, Luke, in a lot of his writings, too, he, he uh, lifts up the women and, and things. And so this is not just for the men. It's for women and men, children, all ages, all age groups. But there is, I think, uh, different stages that he's trying to point out. When we first come to Christ, we're children, we're babes in the Lord. And then as we grow up, and uh, we're learning, we're maturing, and, and we're, we're entering into, um, you know, the, the warfare and the servanthood of what it means to be a Christian. And then as we get, as we get, grow older in the Lord, you know, then we become kind of the, the teachers and the, the people that, that are looking out for others. Um, not that we still don't need growing in our faith, but, you know, we're... We've matured some, and we're looking out for those that maybe, you know, um, are lost and that need guidance, and we can kind of be the spiritual mentors and that sort of thing. So, these three different stages of this spiritual experience, and it doesn't really matter how long you've been a Christian, because, you know, you, you could have uh, been baptized when you were six years old, and you could be 95 years old and still be a baby Christian. You know, if you have not matured in your faith, there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, 
come to the Lord, get in the baptistry, but they never really grow up. And um, so just because you're an old person doesn't mean, you know, that spiritually <laughs> you are where you need to be. Um, you know, you can be a child or a, or a young person, you know, can have a lot of maturity, spiritual maturity. Um, maybe they've progressed quite a bit. So remember that, you know, it's, it's kind of we're going through this. So in verse 12, he starts out, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been, have been forgiven on account of his name. And then he addresses uh, the children again in verse 13. I write to you, dear children, because you are the father. So childhood, you know, is about new seasons of life, new, new birth, and all of that. And the first great mark of a Christian follower, you know, is, of course, when we first come to the knowledge and acceptance of, of what... Christ has come to do, and then we want to be a part of that, you know, and we step out in faith, and uh, we receive Christ Jesus in our lives, we were, we're baptized, we're born again, and we become a child of God, and uh, all over the Bible you can see this terminology, uh, child of God, we're, we're born into God's family, and we talked about, you know, last week about the adoption, how the scriptures also talk about that we're adopted too, and that God is our Father, and He's adopted us into this this family. So we're not part of the family because of creation, uh, because sin came into the world, you know, and separated all human beings from their Creator. And so now, you know, we can be a part of God's family, but it's not. You know, you hear people talk all the time about, you know, we're all God's children, all the people of the earth. Well, in a way, I mean, God created us, but we're not really his children unless we are part of his family, unless we accept Christ Jesus. So, um, we've been brought into the family of God, and um, so God wants us to know him. He wants us to develop that relationship uh, with us, and um, so it's it's because of the fact that, you know, we've he's offered us this gift and we've received this gift of Jesus, we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we're baptized into his death and resurrection, and so now we have new life, everlasting life, and he's provided us with his grace to live from day to day until he comes back or until, you know, God takes us home. But two things here are true of spiritual children. Uh, John says that, you know, as newborn believers, you know, one of the things that we're able to really grasp with our minds, and it should sink deeply within us, you know, if we come to the Lord, is the fact that, you know, we're totally and completely forgiven. And uh, John says in verse 12, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven. They've been let go of. They've been cast as far as the, the east is from the west. From the west. Um, and the Greek grammar indicates that it was it was done in the past at the at the cross, and it continues, you know, to have an effect as we as we live our lives and as we grow. Just as on the cross, Jesus' blood went backwards in time, so all the believers in the Old Testament they were covered by Christ's blood, even though Christ hadn't actually appeared yet. But all their sins that if they were believers, that they were covered by the blood of Christ. Um, and it goes forward. So it's not just, you know, the moment that we're saved, but he covers all of our sins, past, present, and future. And it's all done on the cross. Um, so as I mentioned briefly, I, I want to touch on some scriptures that talk about uh, forgiveness and just some pictures, some um, you know, terminology that uh, some I'm sure you've heard of, some maybe you haven't, but um, Psalm 103, verse 12, that I already mentioned briefly, uh, where it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So the east never uh, meets the west, 
uh, it's this infinite distance, and so God removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. Uh, Isaiah talks about how the fact of it cleansing us uh, and making us uh, pure. Isaiah 1, verse 18 says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. So God cleanses us, purifies us, he removes the, the stain. Um, and then Isaiah uh, also talks about hiding our sin. In Isaiah chapter 38, verse 17, it says, You have um, put your sins behind your back. So that's an interesting one. It's terminology that, you know, God doesn't put our sins out in front of us. He doesn't display our sins so he can look at them. It says he put, takes our sins and he puts them behind his back. Uh, they're behind him. Um, even though we know, you know God knows everything, but in those terms, he's, he's removing it from his side. He's not thinking about it. He's not concentrating on it. He doesn't want to be reminded of it because he's hidden it. He's, he's moved, removed it away out of his sight. Out of sight, out of mind. That's the, the terminology that we say all the time. And that's kind of that picture. Out of sight, out of mind. God's putting our sins behind him. Um, Isaiah also talks about uh, destroying our sin. In Isaiah 43, 25. says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for your own sake. And I will not remember your sins. And then he says something similar in the next chapter in Isaiah 44, 22. He says, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Uh, God also has amnesia when it comes to our sins. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 34. Your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. So they're never brought up again. They're never thrown in our face again. Um, God forgets them. Micah 7 and verse 19. Uh, it says, He treads our sins underfoot and He casts our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And Corey Ten Boom added, and He puts up a sign that says, No fishing. <laughs> so our sins are trampled on they're, they're, they're drowned they're blotted out they're, they're never remembered again they're cleansed they're purified, made white they're hidden, they're removed and we stand before him forgiven so all that Jesus um, God just wants to show us all these different pictures of how he's done this with our sins I mean, there's so many different ways you can describe it. And there's, there's more in the Bible, but those are some, you know. Um, and John goes on here and he says that we have been forgiven on account of his name. So, you know, this means, you know, his name represents who he is. You know, it's account, on account of Jesus' name that we're forgiven by what he's done. So he's our savior. Remember, that's what Jesus means, and he came to save us. And so um, the price has been paid in full. He has saved us. And so we are we're forgiven because of his name. Back in chapter 2 and verse 2 of John, 1 John, uh, John said he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then back in chapter 1, verse 7, the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. So because Jesus, the righteous one, you know, who didn't deserve to die, who did not deserve to come under the, the judgment and the penalty of God, he became our sin bearer. God laid on him our debt. He willingly took it upon himself. He paid the price. And the, his righteousness is now given to us. He takes our sin and we get his righteousness. Pretty good deal, huh? Um, and so that's where the Christian life begins, you know, with this awesome sense of that realization. 
that God has done this and he's offering it to me and it's a gift and I just need to take it. And so that's, you know, such an awesome reality and it's, it's sometimes we need to remind ourselves of those, those childlike beliefs that we came to know years ago. Because the devil tries to get in our head and tell us how bad we are and all that kind of stuff. And, and then we can just quote these verses and say, you know, God has cleansed me. I'm righteous because Jesus has made me righteous and all those things. So on account of, on account of the name of Jesus, we've been forgiven. So if that truly gets into your soul and it, it just, uh, you know, penetrates into your heart like it should, you know, that should give us just this... Always, you know, just a sense of joy and excitement and uh, gratitude, you know, that God has done all these things. So, baby Christians, they hold tight to this truth and they rejoice in it. And uh, when we were all first believers, that's what we were really excited about, right? And then in verse 13, he also says, and I'm writing to you, dear children, because you know the Father. So not only do new believers, you know, know and experience this forgiveness of God, but they also experience a relationship with God in a new way. Because Jesus told us to, to call God Father. And he told them to pray, our Father who art in heaven. And when he was telling that to the, the people around him, uh, that was a new way to pray to God. They weren't used to that. It was too familiar, you know. And uh, but Jesus is like, if you have a relationship with God, you need to see him in this way. He is your father. And so this is kind of a new truth that we come to as baby Christians. You know, we come to this truth that God is now my personal father. You know, and, and some of us might have had terrible fathers on earth. We didn't really get to experience what a real father looked like. Um, but now we can experience that. Whether you have a good father or a bad father, we can experience what a true father uh, means, you know, and what it looks like, and, and just developing that kind of relationship. And now we can pray to God as a, a father. Um, so that's just a, a wonderful personal thing. And uh, <clears throat> you can run to him like a child. You know, when, when a trial, child runs to his father, God wants us to run to him like that. And just jump in his arms and to feel his security, to feel confidence, uh, to feel his love, to feel his peace, to feel his joy. We are really loved by our Father in heaven, and he accepts us. And he wants us to have that deep commitment with him, you know. And so it's not just out of duty, you know, that we're part of his family and we do, we do all the things he's asked us to do, but we're his children. And he gives us things not because he has to, but because he loves us. And we do things for him because we want to serve him because we're his children. Just like when little, you know, when little children come up to their daddies and they say, Daddy, can I help? And, you know, usually they do a terrible job, but... Uh, it's the it's the heart, you know, that they they want to help their dads uh, do something. To they want to be a part of what he's about, and uh, and they love him, you know, and so they want to whatever he's doing. That's where I want to be, and that's what God wants from us, you know. Um, he wants us to be a, wherever God's at, to be a part of it, and get excited about it, and you know, Dad, I want to be where you are. Can I help? And he will help us, and he does and accomplish what we need to do. But, but that's you know that that reality that we come to that we have this this real father. So when we're part of God's uh, family, we learn about God's love, and it's unlike any other love that we've experienced, even if we had good fathers. But it's a very gracious, loving acceptance that our heavenly Father gives us, and so. He knows everything about us, and he still loves us, which is an amazing thing, uh, that God would love us like that. And then, you know, and, and the deeper you get, the more you trust him, the more you realize how much he loves you, and he really does care about you, and you begin to trust him in your life, and 
understand that everything he, he has for us is for our own good. And so we become more and more stable. We start becoming, starting the steps of, of maturity, you know. Uh, we, we realize who we are as part of, of that family. So we're, we're forgiven, we're accepted, um, we are his spiritual sons and daughters, we realize that, that we're forgiven, we realize that we're a part of the family. So I just want to reiterate, have you realized that in your life? Have you, you know, just really entered into that deep kind of relationship where you just see God as a father type figure, you can come to him with anything? You have confidence, you want to be a part of where he's at, where he's working, to serve him, because you love him, and all of that. Um, those are just two wonderful truths, you know, that happen when we, when we first become believers. But God's purpose for us, you know, is to move beyond that, uh, not just receiving forgiveness, not just realizing, you know, that we have this relationship, you know, with, with our Father in Heaven. But the next stage, kind of, is the the teenage years or the or the young adult years um, uh, when you start growing into manhood or, or womanhood so verse 13 I'm writing to you young men because you've overcome the evil one and then at the end of verse 14 I write to you young men because you're strong and the Word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one so the next stage is it, growth. It's you know beginning to resist the devil, the evil one, uh, making sure that the, the word of God is living inside of you. So in the physical world, you know we, we begin to grow from a from a child to a young adult. We become mature. You no longer scream and cry for your parents to bring everything to you and to do everything for you. Well, at least most people are like that. But, um, you know, in our spiritual lives, it's much the same way, you know. Paul says, like I mentioned before, we're no longer to just drink the spiritual milk that we received at the beginning, you know. But he wants us to move on to the, the solid food and become mature in Christ. So we've been trained. We're, we're starting to grow. We, we enter into these spiritual battles. And in verse in chapter four, he's going to talk about that you're an overcomer because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You know, you all know that verse. But you know, Jesus is the one who came, overcame the, the evil one, and when he died on the cross, then he invited us to be a part of that victory. And so as we live by faith, you know, we're going to be overcomers. We're going to overcome evil as well because Christ has already made it possible. He, de he defeated the enemy. Now his spirit lives within us. And so we are greater than the enemy that's out there. And all we have to do is resist the devil. We don't have to give in to the devil. We can say no, we can resist him because we have a greater power inside of us. So we're invited by God, you know, with, the, with this, uh, this God-given opportunity to be, to be overcomers, to grow, uh, to become more and more um, just mature and triumphant in our, in our faith, good conquering evil, and um, Christ and his, his works living in us and through us. So the mark of growth in our spiritual life, you know, is when we're, we're moving into that that area of maturity, those solid foods, and and uh, we're not just asking what benefits me, you know. Oftentimes when people first come to church, or they're church hopping, they call it, they're looking for, they want to be fed, you know, they want to be, they want to be just a church situation that's going to fit their needs. What, what can you do for me, you know? And then as we become more and more spiritual in our walk, we began asking the other question, what can I do for you, Lord? Or what can I do for you, brothers and sisters? Um, it's like what, I just thought of what John Kennedy said. Not, ask not what the country can do for you, but what can you prevent it? So sort of like that, you know, that as you move into your spiritual life, 
You begin wanting to serve and help other people, not just what, you know, I need this and I need that, and just receiving what you can from the church, but you start serving the church and serving others. So being a, a servant, you know, is what it means to be uh, just part of, um, of uh, a maturity, walking in the spirit. And then also, um, he mentions that uh, being mature means that the word of God is a part of your lives. Verse 14, he says, I write to you young men because you're strong and the word of God lives in you. So that, you know, the secret of strength in the Christian life, you know, is the Word of God living in you. The Word of God has its home in you, is what that means. You know, it abides in you. It seeps into your heart and in your mind and in your soul, and it's just a part of who you are. So this is God's way, you know, that he's chosen um, to help us to grow up is by giving us his word and to spend time letting it soak in, letting it transform us so that we become, you know, the young servants, the young soldiers that we need to be fighting in the battle for the Lord. That's what, that's what young men do, you know. Um, when you're at that draft age, you know, then you got to get ready because your country might call you to serve. And um, I don't know that draft age, it's like 21 to 35 or something like that. But anyway, there's that period of time, that young adulthood, where they can draft you. And, uh, and, uh, and you're, because you're young and you're tough and, you know, you're, you're vital. And that's the, that's the stage that we're in in here that John's talking about, that you're, you're strong young men and women. And you're fighting the good fight, you know, you're overcoming the enemy, and you're absorbing all this word. Because as you get older, you're going to forget a lot of it, and so you need to take it all in while you can, while you still have uh, the memory recall and all of that. And uh, so it's so important to spend time in it, to memorize it, to know what it's all about, and just to, to make sure that we're firm in our faith so when evil comes knocking on our door, you know, that we know right from wrong. We don't, yeah. My word, my husband, and my God, that I might not sin against you. So exactly. It, he brings it, he recalls it, or gives it back to us to tell other people or whatever. He helps us for that. And it helps us recall it when we need it, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there's, there's so many ways to just uh, to absorb the word of God. And, and because of our technology in today's age, um, you know, they have CDs, they have DVDs, they have, they have it in every translation. You can just get it, the straight word of God on CD, or you can get the dramatized version where every little sound, every footstep you can hear. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can just, we have just a plethora of ways to absorb the word of God, you know. Andrew, just one that. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, that's a new one. I've heard a little bit of that one. Yeah. What, what was that? James Earl Jones reads the Bible. Oh, I don't know who James. He's Earl the guy who plays Darth Vader in yeah. Star Wars. He's got that good voice. <laughs> He's got that real rich voice. Yeah, just real. Paul. Just yeah. <laughs> Anyway, but yeah, so there's so many versions out there that, that you can uh, that you can look at, and if you like the modern, there's modern translations. I like them all, actually. I mean, you probably noticed from me preaching and teaching that I use all the versions. <laughs> um, and sometimes, you know, uh, the, the new versions just say it better, and, and it just speaks to our kind of language that we have today. But Sometimes I don't like the way they did it, and I go back to the New American Standard or whatever. And, you know, it, so it just depends on the passage, but it's good to kind of get, um, you know, to, to have several different versions of the Bible in your home and to compare them. I have this one that's it compared, it's just the New Testament, but it compares, um, I think it's eight different translations side to side, so you can see how they, they translate it. But, there's just all kinds of ways, you know, to, to, we don't have any excuses here in America. 
Um, there's some, you know, some countries that they don't even still have a language, but they only have one translation. And there's many that just have one translation. So, you know, we're, we're just spoiled. And, <laughs> and sometimes spoiled isn't good because of that. I, uh, I remember somebody saying uh, um, the King James Bible was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for him. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so um, and then and then the the last step here. Let's touch on it real quick. But um, in our spiritual maturity, is you know the the parenthood. I write to fathers because you know who he is uh, from the beginning. So when you move into this stage, you know this is with the mark of. of spiritual maturity, you know, because you start wanting to be more of a parent, you know. You've been down the road quite a long time, and now you want to pass on what you know to the younger people, or just the younger spiritual people, um, before you die, because there's things that you need to pass on, just like a parent would, or a grandparent would. You know, I've learned all this information. I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I've made or just being someone that's always looking out for you know somebody that's in need and just trying to be a grandfather type uh, mentor to somebody. And like I said, it doesn't mean you have to be an old person to be a grandfather type figure. Um, you can be in your 20s or 30s if you've really matured in the Lord. So it's just being uh, you know someone that uh, wants to start caring for others, taking them in your under your wing. Helping mentor somebody else. You know, the Bible talks about that we need to be mentors with others. And uh, Timothy talks about how you know the older women need to mentor the younger women, and the older men need to mentor the younger men. And, and we need to be on top of that more than we are because we don't do that enough. But but just caring, being responsible, wanting to be just a real responsible uh, character. And just being um, looking out for others that that, that need help. So uh, in Third John, John will say, "I've got no greater joy than to know that my children are walking in the truth." And that, that's a parent's heart, you know, because John is looking at this church or the church in large. Um, as you know that he's excited because John is even calling us his children you know and just to know that my children are walking in the truth because you know when by the time John writes his um, gospel and his letters and stuff he's older too and he's 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 experienced quite a bit and now he's you know reaching out to these young church plants and he is excited to know that you know that they're walking in faith, and that he's excited that he can be this mentor to everybody else. And so those are the kind of goals that we need to pursue, you know, to be this ultimately be a mentor to somebody or to many people, preferably, you know, that that need guidance and need help that are just starting out. And so those are kind of the different stages, you know, in our walk, our childhood, and then you know. In between years and then as we get older to spiritually be mentors for others well it's like our time's up let's pray father thank you so much for this passage and we thank you for john's heart and um again just his spiritual insight um he just walked with you for three years and then was a leader in the church for many more years after that and we thank you for the revelation that you've given him and just the insight and we pray that we can learn from your words because ultimately they're your words from your spirit we thank you for instructing us and for giving us so many different uh, letters in the bible to just really uh, learn and to understand i pray that we can just really take the time to absorb it and to just be saturated by your word um, help us to shun the things of the world and to want more of you. Uh, so we ask that you help us to do that this week. Help us again as we enter into 
on Christmas this coming weekend that we will be focused on the birth of your son and what uh, he came to do to save us from our sins and that we will be grateful and we will be praising and worshiping you during this Christmas season. We thank you and love you for all that you have done for us and continue to do for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.